It's good to see each of you this morning. Before I begin, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your promise that your word will not return unto you void, but will accomplish the purpose to which you've sent it. So open our hearts now, Father, for what you have for us from your word today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Far too many weeks ago, I came into a section in 1 Peter where we looked at three specific areas of submission. That first particular area had to do with the submission of believers as pilgrims and sojourners to every ordinance of the man for the Lord's sake. This is a relationship between citizens and government. The second admonition was found in 1 Peter 2, 18 through 25, and herein we were admonished to submit to our masters as godly servants, and we are to do so in respect for them and reverence for God, and Peter tells us this is commendable in the sight of God. And this has to do with our relationship between workers and bosses. The third admonition is to wives and husbands, and that's found here in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. Now, in each of these cases, Peter has admonished us to do these things because we are to go beyond what is right in the eyes of men to what is honorable in the sight of God. And so, as we look at 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, it is directed specifically at wives and then, for a moment, at husbands. Wives, likewise, be submission to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, the key word in each of these three relationships, and particular here in 1 Peter 3, 1, is the word submissive. It's the Greek word hupotasso, and it means to place oneself under someone's authority. This is a personal act that we do. We are not put into submission, we are to place ourselves in submission. And in both of those previous areas that I've mentioned, a wife is to be submissive to her own husband, and that's to be solely on her relationship to Christ. It is not about what kind of a husband she has. It is about her relationship with Christ. And the word likewise here is the Greek word Hamaios, and it's in verse 1, and it's defined as like, of equal degree in manner, and denoting perfect agreement, similarly in like manner. So the impact of that is this, just as we as sojourners and pilgrims are to submit to every ordinance of man for conscience sake, just as servants are to submit to masters, because this is good in the sight of the Lord, in the same manner wives are to submit to their own husbands. And again, this is not based on the character or conduct of the husband, but the relationship of the wife to Christ as her Lord, and is therefore purely a matter of her choice to do so. Now we see this again when we Look at Peter, and he writes, even if some do not obey the word. 
Now, I know it would be wonderful if every wife was perfect and every husband was perfect. That would be wonderful. It's not normal, but it would be wonderful. But in this particular case, Peter is setting up a particular situation. Because he says, even if some do not obey the word. This is a Greek word, apatheo. And it literally means to refuse to be a believer, to reject the Christian message, to refuse to believe. Now, it's primarily translated as disobey, but it's a unique word in the fact that this disobedience is specifically the result of a lack of faith in God. It is disobedience because of disbelief. And we see, again, a parallel in all three of these situations. First of all, as believers, we're to submit to pagan, unbelieving authority. Believing servants are to submit to pagan, unbelieving masters. Believing wives are to submit to pagan or unbelieving husbands. And the motive is the same in each case, to glorify God through our individual lives. Peter strengthens his argument even more as he points out that the wife's motive in submission is that their husbands without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear or respect. In simple terms, and we say it so often, actions speak louder than Actions speak louder than words, all right? In another way, living as and for Christ is far more convincing than merely talking Christ. And so we're looking at the impact of the life. And Peter calls such wives to a chaste conduct. Now, chaste is a word that is closely related to the word hagios. Hagios means holy. But chaste is the Greek word hagnos, and it's better translated innocent, pure, or morally blameless. So Peter is contrasting our outward appearance with a true, truly spiritual heart and mind. And so he tells us here in 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5, and I know this is not going to sit well, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging your hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Now, some have taken that to an extreme. Women shouldn't wear makeup. Women shouldn't wear pretty clothes. Women shouldn't wear jewelry. Those are very small congregations, by the way. Paul is saying, let it not merely be the adornment of the exterior, but the interior of the person. Let your adornment. Adornment is the Greek word cosmeto. Anybody know what that gives us? Greek word cosmeto gives us cosmetics. Absolutely, Mary Kay. That's my wife, Mary Kay, all her life. Um, the literal meaning is to cause something to become beautiful by decorating, beautifying, adorning. Now, what is the history of that? If you go back to the time of Peter and the time of Rome, most of the year the statue of, P of Caesar stood in its place unadorned. But on special occasions, even the statue would be adorned. A crown would be brought out, a robe would be brought out, flowers would be brought out, and the statue would be adorned or made beautiful, cosmetic. But it's all about what you see on the outside. The statue is still cold marble. And there can be no question that the women of that era were just as concerned with their appearance as our era today. And Peter is contrasting that kind of conduct, that 
desire with developing the true and inner beauty of the spirit. In essence, the cosmetic appearance should be consistent with the inner character. It is not to be a replacement for character. Now, Paul echoes this thought in 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 10. Remember, Peter and Paul, uh, both inspired of the Holy Spirit, it only makes sense that what they have to tell us would be consistent. 1 Timothy 2, beginning in verse 8, Paul writes, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Now, there's no question that we would argue for modesty versus immodesty and moderation versus extravagance. But the real issue is why and how a wife adorns or decorates herself in a particular matter. Is she seeking to win her husband to herself or to God? Now, if you think about it, in our world today, and let's forget about the one, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. You know, just ignore that one. But the way to a man's heart is appearance. Looking nice, being beautiful, because it's all about how we look today. That's what our world is about. It doesn't matter if that car has rust underneath. If you put Bondo on it and you've repainted it, that's perfectly fine. It's not what it is, but what it looks like. And so, as we look at Peter, uh, in verse 7 he says, Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, first and foremost, the phrase, as being heirs together of the grace of life, confirms here that Peter has shifted somewhat to where both the believer, or rather both the husband and the wife, are believers. He began with a believing wife with an unbelieving husband. Now he has shifted to believing husbands and believing wives. And this is where we see a parallel with Paul this time from 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 10. Paul writes, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair, or golden pearls, or costly clothing, but that which is proper for women professing godliness, with good works. He then adds to that a, an encouragement from in 1 Peter 3, 5 and 6. He writes, For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good, and are not afraid with any terror. Now, if you've spent time reading in Genesis about the relationship between Abraham and Sarah, you know full well that Abraham was not always the man he should have been, nor was Sarah the woman that she should have been. But nevertheless, Peter focuses specifically on the times when Sarah submitted herself to Abram, even when he was doing something that was utterly foolish and calling him Lord, which affirmed their respective roles. And then in 1 Peter 3, 7, Peter looks to the husbands and he says, husbands likewise in the same manner dwell with them, your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not 
be hindered. Heirs together. Peter's not only concerned for our spiritual unity, our oneness in Christ, but also for our earthly unity. There is so much written in Scripture about the relationship between husbands and wives and how God would have us to treat one another because he wants our marriages to be good. He wants our families to be solid. And so the husband is to dwell with his wife with understanding, which is the Greek word gnosis. It's a very strong word. It means a complete understanding, not just surface, but deep down knowledge. And this suggests a complete and proper understanding of his wife, of her needs, and of her personality. And that will result in him giving honor to her. This is the Greek word, time, and it means worth, respect, esteem, or appreciation. Husbands, understand your wife and her needs so you can give her the respect and the esteem and the appreciation that she needs. The wife is, in Peter's words, the weaker vessel. And if you think back to that first century, women were marginalized throughout the world. Essentially, they were taken advantage of. They were treated as little more than a slave in a pagan world. And it's for that reason that Peter admonished husbands to dwell with them with understanding and to give them greater consideration. You see, this is the unique reciprocity of the Christian marriage. It is different than the world, and that is the point that Peter wants us to understand. She's not property. She's your life partner. She's not owned by him, but she is one with him. She submits to him, but he dwells with her with understanding and consideration for, their, for her. He attributes to her the honor and the value and the respect that their society would not have given them today and is becoming more and more of a problem in today's world. It isn't the way it was even when Holly and I were dating, and that was only 50 years ago. Um, I opened doors for her. I still do. I, there was a lapse in between, I'll admit it, but I opened the car door for her. I opened the door to the house. I opened the door to the store. That way she can get a good run ahead and buy a bunch of stuff before I get into her. But uh, the point is that this is to be a recip reciprocal relationship building up one another. Paul parallels this as well. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the passage, but I do want to read it. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. And just think of what Paul's saying as I read this in light of what Peter has said. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, in order that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, in order that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Christ is the Lord of the church. 
He is the head of the church. He has loved the church, and he's given himself for the church. Therein we see the example for husbands. The church is to be submitted to Christ. She is to follow him and to adore him. There is the example for the wives toward their husbands. Now, I've addressed the passage many times, so I'm not going to focus on the text, but I want to look at the context. Paul is speaking to husbands and wives who are believers. Peter addressed wives whose husbands were unbelievers, and then wives who were believers and, and had husbands that were believers. But it's the same age, it's the same culture, it's the same time, and it's the same admonition. Both men, both apostles, calling on wives to submit to their husbands and husbands to love their wives as themselves. Finally, Peter summarizes this passage with three admonitions and a charge to all believers. I'm looking at 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. And by the way, Peter begins here, finally, this is where the knot is being tied in the rope. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. All of you love as brothers. All of you be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now I said as I began the study in Peter, that Peter was asking Christians to do something that must have seemed impossible. He asked believers to submit to pagan rulers. He asked Christian servants to submit to heathen masters. And he asked Christian wives to submit to unbelieving husbands. Now as he turns to these concluding portions, he says, all of you, all of you, not just these specific groups, but all believers are to be as sojourners and pilgrims, as masters and slaves, as wives, as husbands. All are to be the children of God in a hostile world. Not just the wife, but the husband. Not just the servant, but the master. Not just those who are governed, but those who govern. They were, as we are today, God's show and tell in an unbelieving world. And so Peter admonished them first and foremost, be of one mind, be of a common purpose, be in agreement. If one believer may be dismissed for living differently, the whole of the body of Christ cannot be dismissed. If we as one submit to those who are above us for God's glory, we may be despised, but we cannot be ignored. Because we cannot be ignored, our faith must either be embraced or rejected. You see, ultimately, like the gospel, we are called to live in such a way as to force the unbeliever to make a choice. For Christ or against Christ. We're to provide the example of what choosing Christ brings to our lives. This is what Peter is talking to us about. In this callous world, Peter calls us to have compassion for one another. In a world of hate, he calls us to love one another. In a world indifferent to the individual, he calls us to be tender-hearted. In an arrogant world, he calls us to be courteous and in humble. In a world that seeks an eye for an eye, Peter calls us to not return evil for evil or insult for insult. And finally, he reminds us, he, I would take us back, actually, to 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. 
as we were beginning this study, we looked at why we ought to do the things that Peter tells us to do. So here is his admonition from chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, which has preceded all of these basic principles. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully, completely, entirely upon the grace that is be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Wives and husbands, be holy, for I am holy. Servants and masters, be holy, for I am holy. Citizens and governors, be holy, for I am holy. Now, the world rejects this. That goes without saying. But this is to be the way we are. This is how we make the difference. And Peter takes us back to the Psalms. I just have three verses I'd like to read for you. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now these are words from the Psalms, words from David. Now we fast forward centuries to the time of Peter. And he goes back and draws those words back to his day and shares them again as we now draw them up to our day and share them again. Because this is what God has called us to do. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. He sees our suffering. He counts us faithful. He hears our prayers and he meets our needs. He sees our light shining in this dark world and uses to draw others from darkness to him. This is what Christ told us, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to be lights in this world. Help those who do not know Christ to see us as we take on Christ in our lives, to see the example of how he would live were he here today, how he has called us to live in his place. And Father, through our lives, challenge those around us to seek Christ and to find him. And Lord, give us the privilege of leading them to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you know, uh, I've been having a real struggle with my health this year. I've been to every kind of specialist, anologist, and they poked and prodded and cut me open and emptied me out, filled me back up and everything else. I'm currently working with my cardiologist um, because of the, the current situation. But it is with deep regret that I present my resignation as senior pastor of Abundant Life Baptist Church. Ongoing health issues, the likelihood that they're not going to be soon resolved, compel me to make this decision for the sake of my health and the greater good of the church. The knowledge that I can no longer fulfill my ministerial responsibilities as I understand them compels me to make this decision at this time. Holly and I have greatly appreciated your love and concern over these past 15 years, and I trust God will continue to bless you in the years that remain until his return. In keeping with the church constitution, Article 4, Section 1, Paragraph E, I have tendered my resignation to the deacons on October 1st, and I'll be ending my ministry here on October 31st. Uh, Lord willing and providing, I'll be in the pulpit the next few Sundays. 
I have to do it sitting. I can't stand anymore. If I stand more than 20 minutes or 15 minutes, my blood pressure will drop 20 to 30 points. And quite honestly, it's not working, as you all know. We love you. We'll be around here till June. We're in a lease. But my ministry here will officially end at the end of this month. Thank you. We love you. God bless.